namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambhutassa aparutha de sangamatassa taura ye sorvantha bhamunchantu satam So today we, uh, I'll reflect on uh, consciousness and wisdom, how do they come together? So these are two words with significant meaning, because wisdom is, it can be, you know, there's worldly wisdom, there's street wisdom, Survival is a kind of the survival wisdom, learning how to live, how to get on, the wisdom of morality, of keeping precepts, the five precepts, seeing the result of keeping as a layperson as a, these five precepts as a basic kind of uh, suggestions for action and speech. And then ultimate wisdom, or panya. So in the Pali tradition, there's always a sata, which is translated generally as faith, and panya, balanced by sati, or mindfulness, awareness. So then we ask ourselves, what is consciousness? <clears throat> and uh, I mean, that, as we all are aware, that's subject that I've particularly investigated, spent so many years investigating, uh, trying to understand consciousness as a reality rather than just as a concept in a in, a psych, in, in psychology or science or in Buddha Dhamma. And wisdom, in terms of ultimate wisdom. And so the wisdom, ultimate wisdom is very simple. When you realize it, it's realizing the way it is. All conditions are impermanent. Dhamma is not a personal self. All Dhamma is anatta or non-self. So when we bind ourselves to what we're not, then that's avicca or lack of wisdom. So, you know, the suffering is uh, caused by this lack of wisdom by this identity we hold to conditioned phenomena, sankharas. So when we reflect on all conditions are impermanent, that's, we learn that very early on in, when we take an interest in meditation, sape sankharani cha, sape tama and dhamma is non-personal. So we might believe that, that sata, or we find it interesting. At first, when we read that in the scriptures, you know, we, we, we adopt that, and when we can quote, you know, to each other, all 
conditions are impermanent, you know, and then we think we're wise. But the wisdom that comes is you can you can cling to wisdom sayings, wisdom teachings without being necessarily wise. The self, if you're still operating from the sense of the words themselves or the belief in the words without investigation, without bhavana or meditation. So as Buddhists, you know, the word Buddhist is a term, collective term, for anyone that wants to identify with that word. Dhamma is teaching of the Buddha. And so the, we've got this, this very interesting juxtaposition where there's a Dhamma which is formless. You can't find Dhamma as an object. It's not a word. The best, you know, the best we do is use the word dhamma itself, put it into an English context. But the dhamma is to be realized for oneself. So it's when we chant bhajatang, it means that we have to realize dhamma for ourselves, not just believe that in dhamma as some concept because the word itself is a mere concept. And then sada, translated as faith, is really not like a belief, so much a belief, a blind belief in Dhamma, but a, an interest that you take in the Dhamma teachings and the scriptures and the suttas so you have enough faith, enough interest to investigate on the intellectual level the Dhamma as expounded in scriptural presentations. So there's Sattā and Panya operating together through mindfulness. And if there's not mindfulness, then there's just belief that there's something called Dhamma and, and you merely remain a belief in words and in concepts, in theories and doctrines and beliefs that you acquire from books or from teachers, from religious conditioning. So consciousness, which you can't find, but you know you're conscious. So I say this repeatedly just for, for you to, to ascertain this for yourself. To, to ask, your, ask yourself the question, am I conscious? Which might seem like a silly question to the average person, but because you know you are conscious. Without having to ask, am I conscious? And what is consciousness? Show me. Show me what it is. And then you can't show me, but you can show me what arises in consciousness. You can show me, you can talk about your feelings or your views and opinions about yourself as a man or woman, uh, you know, and, and we've all got these, this language to describe condition phenomena in detail, in analysis, analytical details. We take a great interest in our personalities, in each other's personalities. <clears throat> and so personality is a, something that arises in consciousness. You know, it's, it, it has its manifest, manifest and then it ceases in consciousness. So this is where the encouragement to really 
investigate what is personality when you your personality, ego, sakyaditi, the, the belief, the kind of confidence you have that you are a, a special person or a separate form in the universe that is supported by worldly view that we have been conditioned under. So, like we've been, even in Buddhist countries like Thailand or Sri Lanka, people are conditioned by Buddhist teachings, which tend to be belief in, in, in Buddhist teachings, and the emphasis that Lung Pao Cha was always making was budgetang, to find out for yourself what, what Dhamma is as a reality of here and now, you know, rather than just, and get beyond the concept, con concept of the word and the traditional belief about it. So this is why we're actually here, why establishment like Amravati exists is uh, to provide this opportunity to investigate conscious living forms and the formless. So in the Buddha, when the Buddha was passing away, his disciple Ananda said, how are we, what are we going to do without our teacher? When you die, we won't have a teacher. And he said, I leave you the Dhamma and the Vinaya. So the Vinaya is a form. Dhamma is formless. So this is, I found this very fascinating, this relationship of the manifest and unmanifested forms and emptiness. Consciousness, which has no form. Space, which has no form. But what does have form is, is the earth, fire, water, air condition, the phenomena that we ignorantly, out of ignorance and conditioning, we cling to and identify with this, with these forms. And when you contemplate problems, personal problems or, or communal problems or political problems, it's all around views and opinions, around the forms. So in the scriptures and the, about the Vinaya, the endless arguments among bhikkhus was around Vinaya, about the forms. But the formless, you can't argue about. Because argue, arguing takes thinking, and thinking is a form. So there is the unborn, uncreated, unformed, unconditioned. I can't impress you enough on the importance of this particular teaching, which I've emphasized here at Amravati. There is the unborn, uncreated, unformed, unconditioned. And if there was not such, if there was not the unborn, uncreated, unformed condition, there'd be no escape from the formed, the born, the created, the formed, the condition. And what is suffering? comes from is attachment to the forms, to the born, the created, the form, the condition. So that's why even in the best of situations where everything is, you know, secure and safe and friendly and harmonious and wealth and abundance and good food and worldly happiness, there's still this sense of suffering. As you probably are well aware by now, well, you wouldn't be here. 
that no matter how successful in the world or how acclaimed you might be as an important person, as an individual, special case, it's still the basic ignorance might still be there. The avicca, the ignorance of the lack of wisdom, knowing that all conditions are impermanent, all dhamma is not self. So how do you investigate formless, unborn, uncreated, unformed, unconditioned? Try to, try to investigate it with your intellect. Because, you know, I used to experiment with myself and just trying to imagine the unborn, uncreated, unformed, unconditioned. And you can't do it, there's no image. The best thing is like this circle, this kind of Zen circle, a zero. There's, a, there's no form to the unborn, uncreated, unformed, unconditioned. And language itself is created, it's born, it's formed, it's conditioning. So when trying to find the unborn, uncreated, unformed, unconditioned through analysis, through thought, it stops the, the thinking process because you can't imagine it. You can't remember it. There's no memory of unborn, uncreated, unformed, unconditioned. There's no image, no imagination. So when there's no memory, no image, what's left is conscious awareness, isn't it? You don't die or pass out when when the when you let go of the born, the created, the form, the condition. So wisdom is this this understanding. It's it's uh, you know it's natural to us. It's not a you don't even have to be literate to realize dhamma. You can be completely illiterate and still realize. Dhamma, because it's what you really are, rather than an illiterate individual person compared to the well-educated, the fortunate, the gifted, the special. So the unborn is silent. It's reality itself. So it's not, it's not like dying or becoming a zombie. But it's the real realization. It is real. It is permanent. It is here and now. It's budget time to be realized individually. Because right now I'm doing my best with words to point to that, but I can't, I can't describe Dhamma, the Dhamma that we take refuge in. I can't define it. Is it good or bad? You can say it's the ultimate good, but it's not about ultimate or good or bad. It's where good and bad, good and evil, right and wrong cease. Because they are qualities of conditioned phenomena. You know, so phenomena can have, can be beautiful or ugly, good or bad, right or wrong, true and false.
So this is, is like a realization of something quite very ultimate simplicity rather than some remote complex realization that you might imagine it to be. Like is an enlightened person, when we talk about an enlightened monk or nun, would they be, you know, would they be walking on air or, or would they be, you know, how would they appear? And then we have the, the scriptural teachings of the Buddha, the life of the Buddha, you know, so then we, we do take an interest in the Sakyamuni Buddha, Gotama Buddha of ancient India, you know, so we, was he, uh, did he lose his personality and feelings and was he just some kind of, uh, kind of phantom of perfection? that we might try to imagine and that Buddha might be, or when you read the scriptural teachings, life of the Buddha is very, he still had human form, had to eat, had to got sick, had pain, and was criticized and condemned and plotted against like anyone else. He didn't float in the ether when the when the body died, it decayed like any other body. So what was Gautama the Buddha pointing to when he said there's a Dhamma, which is to be realized individually by the wise. So, you know, when, you, when I talk about faith or sattā, the Pali word sattā, Trust in this. When I say trust in awareness, this isn't about trusting my, what I'm saying, you know, but, it, but trusting in your ability to be aware here and now. It's like this. Awareness, consciousness, wisdom all come together. Wisdom is not something alien you have to get, that you don't have. Unless you're firmly convinced you are this physical form, this personality, and you feel you're not wise, or maybe you're very conceited and think you are terribly wise. So even, you know, the conceit, I'm very wise monk, is, is still sakyaditi. Because that's not how it works. You don't cling to identities. All those, all those identities are just words that are conditioned, that are phenomena. They manifest and then they disappear in conscious awareness. And it's in this conscious awareness that you find freedom, non-suffering. So in, in bhavana, in meditation, you know, the, just the simple non, ex, realities of non-suffering in daily life, rather than seeing meditation as something you do through formal retreats and special postures, you know, you begin to integrate wisdom and mindfulness into ordinary life into the movement of sitting, standing, walking, lying down. And just by observing how, if you're patient, with silent awareness, then the, the negative moods, fears, anxiety, worry about the future, really worry about the future, you know, and look at it. You know, think of all, intentionally, I advise you to really worry, but look at it, observe it. 
can you know you have to keep it going you have to hold to to the gloom doom predictions for the future or your own health or future life you know you have to keep thinking you have to keep holding on to moods to perceptions to be depressed and to be in the constant state of anxiety and worry so rather than try to get rid of worry, anxiety, depression, you know, like we do personally, none of us want to be worriers or anxious or depressed. We want to be happy and have fun and loving and kind and good. But don't be frightened of this other side, the dark side, the shadow. But get to know it. It arises and ceases the same as the saintly, the good, the beautiful. And what remains when there's non-attachment, non-identity, no concept, no opinion, there's still conscious awareness. It's silent, peaceful. It's ultimately beautiful. But tends to be ignored, overlooked, and dismissed because the urgency of worldly life is always about success and failure, praise and blame, survival as a human, as a animal form, finding food, trying to protect yourself, caught up in the survival, sexual habits and conditioning of the forms, and making value judgments about them as good or bad, right or wrong, or problems, or suffering. So in the First Noble Truth, Suffering is to be understood. And so, the, again, I re repeat, to understand suffering, you have to look at suffering, not, to, not try to get rid, rid of it, or see it always as per, some personal problem. You know, as a person, I, you know, just observing my own personality. I've trained myself to witness my personality in both its positive and negative aspects. And then to, so I get to know the causes of suffering, attachment to these positive, negative perceptions of of sakaditi, of the ego, of the self. And it's interesting in monastic life, you know, it's, uh, the, the ego operates very strongly in monastery. So like our seniority, our position, our, our, whether we're monks or nuns or lay people or Buddhists or we aren't Buddhists or we're atheists or we're nothing. You know, we hold our positions, our sense of importance or our feelings of lack of importance, lack of respect that we might feel when we're treated disrespectfully by others. These are all conditions of the, you know, which we can put under the label Sakya Ditti or personality. Because it's a habit pattern. We learn it from an early age to see ourselves in, it, with, with this identity, with the body, the, the, the social, cultural conditioning is part of, you know, this sense of 
identity which separates us from ultimate reality or makes us think we're separate from that. Ultimate reality remains an abstract idea in the mind or, you know, in terms of God or Dhamma. Or ultimate truth, you know, these are words that are the best you can do to try to describe Dhamma or ultimate reality. So, you know, in this tradition we call Dhamma ultimate reality, but what, you know, that's a concept. Ultimate and reality are still concepts. So then, try to imagine ultimate reality, you know, just by trying to describe what ultimate reality must be. You have to use superlatives. It's most beautiful, it's all loving, it's, it's perfect, or it's oblivion. or it's rubbish, or whatever, you know, however you, you react to it emotionally, you know, but when you describe God, you use superlatives. Superlatives are words, you know, taken to the, to the ultimate, best possible thinking level you can, you can imagine. So when we investigate reality itself, worldly conditions, the past is a memory. So how many of us spend our lives suffering about the past, remembering the injustice or the, the, the foolish things we did when we were young or, or, you know, the unfairness of life or the lack of success, of not being successful enough or not being respected, being alone as an old person by yourself. You know, one can, you know, in old age, you, you, uh, you know, if you have no escape from the formed and the born and the condition, then you have to live with memories of the past. That's what old age is like. And so some of those past memories are pleasant, some are unpleasant. But they all come and go and change and the mood according to those memories, you can be, you know, feel happy or good or inspired or you can feel depressed or anxious or worried or regretful or guilt-ridden. But once you realize the end of suffering, niroda, in simple things, so in this, you know, as the 2021 comes to an end, you know, then the winter's retreat, you have this three months, January, February, March of 2022, kind of opportunity where the emphasis can be on awakening to reality, to investigating Dhamma, because a busy life, sometimes we, we forget, we get caught up in our worldly habits, our position in the Sangha, our relationships with others, <clears throat> our views about Amravati or other monasteries or about other teachers. You know, we can gossip and chit-chat and go on endlessly about, you know, various things we like and dislike in the world. But, the, you know, this particular temple is, is uh, I always found a kind of pleasant environment for reflection. 
But reflection in daily life is, is very important, more important than retreat. Because this non-suffering is our true nature. It's natural. It's not created, it's not formed. It's not born, that has no birth, no death. So what is it at this moment when you're sitting here listening to me? What is the Dhamma here and now? The unmanifest, unborn, uncreated, And just by asking yourself questions like that, you know, it stops the thinking mind because you have to stop thinking to, to reflect. And you usually see it as doubt. You know, when, we, when we're attached to thinking, to try to resolve, get answers to all our questions and problems through analysis and through thought, then when there's no thought, when there's no suffering, you know, we, we believe that it's not, it's not important because our problem, personal problems, can seem ultimately more important than ultimate reality. So the ego is like that. It can, can create this sense of incredible importance about my feelings in regards to the Sangha, in regards to the world around me. And this is, you know, so the self becomes the important issue rather than, than looking at the self, no matter how it might manifest. If, my, if I hold the view my personal problems are more important than anything else, then I, I, I wouldn't particularly want to hold to that view as a person even, because I don't believe that my problems are most important. But sometimes when situations arise, that does arise. This seems more important. My particular problem of the moment seems more important than the whole Sangha or the world at that moment. And yet, rationally, I know that's rubbish. So I tend to put it down as rubbish as unimportant, but what is here and now, I, I don't, if I don't understand that, if I have no insight into the non-suffering, then I'm either caught in indulging in my self-pity or anger or resentment, or I'm trying to suppress it or figure out what's wrong, why do I hold grudges or feel this way after so many years? You know, so I endlessly think about myself as a person with psychological problems that, I sh you know, I'd like to get rid of. Because as a person, I'd like to think of myself as one who has spent all these years as a Buddhist monk with great success and and, you know, I'm elderly and senior and all that. So, you know, in one way, the, the personal identity with the age, with the position, with memories. But still, that alone itself is still suffering because I, if I attach to those perceptions, then, then there's always danger of disrespect or being ignored or being criticized. So there's no way the self, the separate self, can ever be truly happy because its very nature is suffering. The ego is a, is a very, is the living example of suffering, being separate being identified with unsatisfactory conditions for, for a whole lifetime is sad, it's pathetic, when the opportunity to awaken 
to ultimate reality is always here and now. So in daily life, just in working life, in daily ordinary life in Amravati, the conditions arise for suffering. Jealousies, fears, resentments, feeling superior, feeling inferior, feeling confused, wanting to leave, wanting to something else, wanting to go somewhere else, are all forms of, of uh, thinking. But they're all teachers to us when we observe them. Is it wrong to think I want to leave? Or is it, you know, we can tell you you're wrong, you should stay. <clears throat> but there's no more words. But even wanting to leave is still a something born condition, limited, because all it can leave is a physical body leaving from one place to another. The basic problem of suffering is still generated through this ignorance or lack of wisdom. So I encourage you to resolve the problem here and now, and that's the, the Four Noble Truths emphasis. And the Third Noble Truth of Neroda, what is that? What is the end of suffering? And just in a little way, just if you experiment, when you're, when you're suffering, when you feel upset or angry or doubtful or worried. See it as opportunity to, to really look at that, to observe this feeling, I, I resent what this, this kind of situation. You know, and make it, rather than just dismiss it, make it come to life. Listen to it, the sense of me as a separate person upset over what somebody said is like this. And then you, you kind of, you know, you're witnessing it rather than indulging in it, analyzing it or trying to get rid of the thought. So this is bhavana, this is what meditation is about. It's not developing some technique to tranquilize your mind temporarily but it, it integrates into daily life and using the experiences that you personally have as an individual member of, of this group, you know, whatever, however they manifest, they're your teachers. They're what you learn from, that they arise and cease. They're the born, the created, the form, the condition. And there's no escape from them, except through the unborn, uncreated, unformed, unconditioned. And that is here and now, that's Dhamma. That's conscious awareness. So as you have more faith in this practice, then wisdom, more wisdom, faith and wisdom balance each other with mindfulness. So I offer this as a reflection. <clears throat> <clears throat>